Hi, I'm Lisa Johnson. You can reach me at lisajohnsonphd at gmail.com or at CuriousMind on Twitter. And I hope you enjoy this tutorial. The major reference for it is Keller and Suzuki's use of the ARC's motivation model in courseware design that's found as a chapter in Jonathan's Instructional Designs for Microcomputer Courseware from 1988. And you can see there on the screen, there's a picture of me in front of a seismic formation actually in the Borrego Springs area of California. And as I stood there, it occurred to me that creating multimedia is very much a, a process of time and pressure and, and a great deal of work. Um, but I'm happy to provide this for you. It's part of my both responsibility and my passion as a, prof a professor. So if you'd like to give me attribution, there's a suggested citation there on the screen. Ultimately, though, just remember, I am a professor, so be cool. If you can use this, I encourage you to do so. Just be sure to give me attribution where appropriate. And remember to share this with the same license if you can, which is a attribution share like Creative Commons. If you go commercial with your creation and become a zillionaire, the universal laws suggest you might want to contact me with a thank you. Thank you so much for viewing this tutorial. I hope you have much to gain from it. So first, let's review some of the purpose and goals. One of the first things we're going to do is recognize the features of the ARC's motivation model. And then you'll have opportunities to recall learning experiences with the four factors of the ARC's motivation model. Next, you'll have opportunities to recognize strategies for implementing the four factors of the ARC's motivation model in online learning contexts. And next, you'll also have, through this whole experience, the opportunity to experience an effective multimedia tutorial created with presentation, screen capture, and audio recording software. And finally, if you prefer, you can participate in the optional activity, which involves three stages, informing, confirming, and transforming. Just a quick note here, multimedia in this tutorial is defined as any multiple medium curated to communicate one or more messages. The messages may range from the intentionally instructional for a specific audience or the unintentionally instructional. This tutorial may serve both purposes, although it was designed with a specific audience in mind. So who is that audience? Essentially, the audiences this was designed for include anyone interested in learning design, whether you're a scholar, a learner, a practitioner, or some combination thereof. You might wish to adapt or integrate this into your designs, such as for debates and discussions. Use it for elaborations about the ARCS model, or possibly an exemplar for various reasons. And finally, it can serve as an informational and reinforcement job aid. So here's the suggested activity. Remember, all these steps are optional because it is only suggested. The first step would be an informing activity. As you review the tutorial, you can pause the video and write a response to each of the thinking activities presented with the 12 ARC strategy dimensions. Next, if you prefer, you can do a confirming activity by creating a multimedia presentation that, at a minimum, presents your personal examples from step one of the applications and experiences of the 12 ARC strategy dimensions. And finally, as a transforming activity, you could share your creation from step two in some public format, such as a video response to this tutorial, and you could send me a hyperlink at lisajohnsonphd at gmail.com. I may use what's submitted to create other objects, so keep that in mind as you submit your links to me. Thanks so much in advance. I hope you take advantage of this optional activity, and perhaps you'll design one of your own as well. Let's start with an overview of the ARC's motivation model. So first, during the late 1970s and early 1980s, Keller developed a four-factor theory to explain motivation. It's since been elaborated on and applied across the entire learning ecosystem. And it essentially started with ideas and evidence. And as more of those ideas and evidence got added, then we became firmly grounded here with the ARCs as a four-factor theory or conceptual model. The four factors are attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. These inform the conceptual framework, or theory, and they act as the guiding strategies that solve instructional problems associated with each factor. And it's because of that aspect of the ARC's model that it also works as a process model. The strategies inform learning designs that seek to stimulate or maintain each of the motivational factors, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. And each of these feeds into each other so that the more strategies that are employed, the more ideas and evidence come about, strengthening further the conceptual model or underlying theory known as ARCs. That is the basis of this tutorial and the instructional design model that we're discussing. Let's start with the first of the four factors, attention. 
in order for designs to be effective attention needs to be aroused and it needs to be sustained this means that learning will involve a state of curiosity which involves the act of imagination it's also going to involve a state of sensing which is involves the act of recall now there are several strategies for gaining attention in the classroom in any formal learning context and these range from perception and inquiry to variability as each of these strategies are presented on the screen you may stop a moment and reflect on the questions asked jot down your responses if you're taking part in the activity so first with perception you would want to think of a learning experience where you encountered the use of novel, surprising, incongruous, or uncertain events. These would be moments of dissonance or resonance in your learning. As you're designing for perception, it helps to think of experiences you've had where your perception was aroused and possibly sustained. Next is inquiry. Here you would want to think of a learning experience that stimulated information-seeking behavior in you by having you generate questions or a problem to solve, or that posed questions or problems for you to solve. It's always better when the learner can create their own, but sometimes it works to provide those as well. Having students start with inquiry is a great way to grab their attention and sustain it over the learning design. And finally, there's variability. In any design, you'll want to have some variability in your instructional technique. So as you start to think about designing for variability, think of learning experiences where your interest was maintained by a variety of instructional techniques and activities. Next, let's take a look at relevance, the second factor in the ARC's motivation model. In order for designs to be effective, relevance needs to be perceived as helpful for accomplishing goals, whatever those goals are for the learner. This means that learning is going to involve a state of interest, which has the act of interpersonalization, or self-reflection. There's also a state of wonder involved in learning with relevance, and this involves the act of anticipation of what's coming next, how it's going to serve the goals and the entire learning moment. There are three categories of strategies or dimensions for relevance as well. Familiarity, motives, and goals. Starting with familiarity, if you're going to design in this area, you'll want to think of a learning experience that use language and examples that relate to your experiences and values. For goals, you'll want to think of a learning experience that provided you with statements or examples of the objectives and utility of the instruction and either presented goals for accomplishments or had you define them. Having learners define goals is very effective for making sure the instruction is relevant to their needs. And finally, goals in general and motives. You'll want to think of learning experiences where the teaching strategies match your tendencies and preferences. This is important because in order to have strategies that match your tendencies and preferences, you'll want to be aware of those. Multiple styles and inventories and profiles of preferences for learning are available and it's encouraged that you would incorporate these into your design or at least as part of some pre-assessment in the instructional design process. This falls into an analysis stage for design, of course. Moving on to confidence, the third factor in the motivation model, we can see that in order for designs to be effective, confidence needs to be perceived as involving some level of success. The learner needs to go into the learning situation, in other words, anticipating some form of success. This means that learning is going to involve a state of challenge and the act of effort. And so this involves a certain level of motivation that we've been able to hopefully arouse in the learner through attention getting and relevance setting. And to the point that when we reach the confidence stage in our design, the learner has this as perceived at this point that something that they can achieve and do so well. Confidence strategies range from requirements, successes, and control dimensions. In the requirements dimension, you might think of a learning experience that helped you estimate the probability of success by integrating performance requirements and evaluative criteria as instructive feedback in the activity design. That would simply be any design that you might have experienced or that you could create that involves the use of rubrics or other checklists and things to make sure that the students know exactly what's expected of them, this will help increase their confidence in the learning moment. There's also successes. You'll want to think of learning experiences that provided you with challenge levels that afforded meaningful success experiences under both learning and performance conditions. 
so that you could feel some success both when you're receiving knowledge as well as when you're demonstrating your ability to apply that knowledge. As you design for successes, think of ways for students to feel the confidence from the learning experience that otherwise may not exist through the design. How can you design for success? And finally, control. You'll want to think of learning experiences here that provide a feedback and opportunity for control over content and activities that might support preferences for learning. So again, knowing your preferences for learning is important, and knowing those preferences of your design audience is also very important. And giving the learner control over their experiences, alternative and personalized pathways for learning are extremely valuable when designing for control to raise confidence and motivation for design. The final factor is satisfaction. Let's review some of its key features now. So for a design to be effective, satisfaction needs to be reflected in the synthesis of the learning design, which simply means that learning is going to involve a state of reconciliation, which is the act of remembering. Stat satisfaction strategies range from consequence, equity, and reinforcement. Now, when you're designing for consequence, you're going to want to think of learning opportunities and experiences that provided areas for you to apply knowledge and skill in situated settings with personalized contexts, which essentially means there's some real outcome from the behavior that the student is practicing. Whatever the learner is going to do needs to have a certain authenticity to it. You can also design for reinforcement. If you think of a learning experience that provided you with personalized feedback and reinforcements that sustained the desired behavior in you, both within and external to the learning experience, these can be very valuable. Designing for a reinforcement involves not only reinforcement within the class context, that is, but also beyond the class context. How will the behaviors that are learned in your course or your instructional moment transfer beyond that moment? Those are things to think about when designing for reinforcement. And finally, equity. When you're designing for equity, you'll want to think of learning experiences that consistently applied expectations and consequences for task accomplishment. This is equity within the learner's grading and evaluation, all forms of assessment, formative and summative, as well as across learner populations within groups. How you design for equity is very important because it's going to give students the sense of satisfaction of a job well done, if well done, and all of these factors together can increase the motivation to see the learning through to completion. Thank you for viewing the ARCS Motivation Model Learning Design Tutorial. I hope you found this useful. I look forward to your feedback.